All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for today's session. A few housekeeping items for us all today. Um, we do have attendees um, automatically muted. Um, so the Q&A box on the bottom of the Zoom is your place. Feel free to hop on there and drop in any questions that you would like answered. Time permitting, we hope to get to all of them today. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us after the panel. Um, we are really excited for today's session. We have David Medvedev, um, CEO and co-founder of Aspen RX Health. Uh, we have Blair, uh, the founder of the Pharmapreneur Academy, who you all are probably very familiar with at this point. And we have Laura Cranston, who I think is experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty. <laughs> so she might be joining us here in just a few moments. But for the sake of time, um, we know that you all have a very full and busy day. So we wanted to jump in and get started. The, the way that today's session will flow, it's about an hour long conversation. We already have some questions that we have um, received from you all. So we wanted to kind of jump in. But first, before we do that, I know you likely all have met a few of the folks on the on the call today, but wanted to properly. So David is the co-founder um, and CEO of Aspen RX Health. Uh, his desire to reimagine the potential of pharmacists by bringing innovative economic models and groundbreaking technology into the arena for the first time is the reason that we're all here today. His part in disrupting the pharmacy model is perhaps inevitable when considering his trajectory. He began at Eckerd Corporation, managing a team of pharmacists focused exclusively on delivering medication therapy management services in a retail pharmacy setting long before Medicare adopted a similar model. David had the first exposure in working with a technology team when he joined Gold Standard, uh, quickly became fascinated by the combination of healthcare and technology, and now he and our entire team here um, are committed to solving problems related to the patient experience and health literacy. Um, we have Blair with us, who is an MTM and business management consultant pharmacist who consults on and produces e-learning programs for state and national organizations, pharmacy wholesalers, payers, and technology startups like Aspen RX Health. She has books and online courses available for individuals looking to leverage their pharmacy knowledge um, and translate that into monetized clinical programs at the pharmapreneuracademy.com. She speaks internationally about trends in leveraging pharmacists to improve value-based care. And Laura Cranston, who we hope will be with us in a moment, is also a pharmacist by education. She currently serves as a growth consultant to Aspen RX Health and throughout her career and most notably in her former role as founder and CEO of the Pharmacy Quality Alliance, her career has remained squarely focused on optimizing the safe and appropriate medication use by tapping into the clinical expertise of pharmacists and enabling them to practice at the top of their license. Um, in her role with us, as, uh, Laura works alongside team members and the pharmacist community like yourselves to build innovative uh, developmental programs and help identify strategic partnerships for Aspen to further um, our position as the pioneer in modern pharmacy. So thank you all so much for joining us. We hope today's discussion will be robust and interactive and we're excited to get to all the questions. So David, the first question actually came in for you. Um, and it says that statistics tell us that 55% of drug spend is now spent on specialty medication. And so it only makes sense that the needs for patient education is becoming more complex. Can you tell us about how you envision the future of the pharmacist role in delivering meaningful patient care to these specific populations? Sure. Thanks, Jen. Good morning. And uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, before I start, I just want to say that I am truly humbled to be on this panel with Blair and Laura. Uh, absolute privilege and wish all of our pharmacist colleagues uh, a happy pharmacist week. Uh, just some great things and energy going on this week, uh, reflecting all of the hard work we do as pharmacists. So thank you and, and thanks for all you do working with Aspen and uh, more broadly as pharmacists. Uh, so to maybe answer the question about specialty pharmacy, uh, I think first it's fair to say that when we started Aspen RX Health just a few short years ago and have only really been commercial now for you know less than 24 months, our intent was never just to be an MTM only company. 
our focus was to have a starting point to start in a part of the profession in the industry, if you will, where there is a defined practice and then iterate from there. And so if we're paying attention, we recognize first how robust the specialty pharmacy pipelines are, you know, just how profound these therapies can be to changing the direction of illness and, and getting people well. They're very complicated medications. These are uh, technologies. And uh, just like there's a, a geek squad that you could hire to come and wire up your stereo and hang a TV, you know, what's missing today is the personal pharmacist in this specialty medication journey. Uh, so too often these medications are distributed from centralized pharmacies. Uh, they're distributed through limited distribution sites and the community pharmacist is lost in that process. And so I believe that Aspen as a platform enabling these entrepreneurs and these and the pharmacist practices that we're creating can play a real outsized role in supporting specialty pharmacy going forward. So it starts just fundamentally with uh, when you receive the package, how do you store it? How do you administer it? How do you dispose of it? But it gets more macro than that. So these patients typically don't have just one disease. They're comorbid and they're getting medications from their community pharmacy and from their specialty pharmacy. And so who's quarterbacking in the middle and supporting not only the patient, but their families and what to expect, the types of drug-drug interactions that they may be encountering and the adverse drug events that they should expect and then mitigate you know, as they continue to use these meds. So I'm excited about the future of our role as Aspen RX Health and the community of our pharmacists in supporting this, but it'll be one product, one therapeutic category at, at a time. And what's really interesting about what we're building is the ability to match specialists. So if you are a pharmacist in our community, and you are um, an autoimmune specialist or you are a behavioral health specialist, you really get to practice in an area that motivates you, that is at the top of your license. And that'll give the patient a remarkable experience and ultimately our collective customers a great experience. So um, my two cents on specialty, I'm excited about it one day at a time, but we're making progress uh, jumping into that channel. Thanks, David. Um, the next question we just received is, can you tell us a bit more about the future types of roles and clinical interventions um, that we can expect for our pharmacist community in 2023? Is that to be again, Jen? Yes. Uh, so, you know, getting more specific to Aspen RX Health and, and what we're thinking about in our community, um, if I understand the question. So, I, I mean, as recently as an hour ago, I mean, literally an hour ago, we've just turned on a new service line for our pharmacists uh, in an area that we call polypharmacy, but it's CNS and behavioral health. And so, again, these are patients who are polypharmacy, um, using multiple medications. We know from quality measures, clinical literature, uh, that there, there are better ways to treat these conditions than just throwing more and more meds at the problem. Um, so we will continue to iterate. We are not going to stay in the MTM lane. We may expand MTM from just Medicare into Medicaid and into commercial, but we also know that there are other opportunities for us, as I just described around specialty. Um, but we're looking at things like post-discharge medication reconciliation. We're looking at uh, new starts to therapy and overcoming health literacy even approaching SDOH, social determinants of health issues, where we may find pharmacy deserts, patients suffering from loneliness, access and affordability concerns. Those are all areas that we are exploring currently with our customers and potentially new customer channels as well. I think that that's a, I mean, like, as I'm, I'm, I'm hearing David talk, I'm getting more and more excited. So I'm, I apologize for jumping in, but, you know, just hearing, all of these opportunities that are available for pharmacists, uh, you know, it really, it really does feel like this is the time to begin to prepare for what the advancement of the profession actually looks like in terms of clinical service. Because so many years we've been saying pharmacies at a crossroads, and and it feels like we're at the point that's finally crossing that crossroads. So I'm really excited to hear you say all that, David. Yeah, thanks, Blair. Um, I'll stop talking. The, I don't think people dialed in to hear me talk uh, all the time. So um, what I will say is um, the team at Aspen hears me all the time. I, I use lots of cliches and axioms and, um, you know, perfect can be the enemy of good. And I graduated pharmacy school, you know, embarrassed to say uh, more than 20 years ago now. 
And um, at that time, we were saying we were at a crossroads and we were going to wait for the Social Security Act to reform and for pharmacists <laughs> to be acknowledged as providers. And we just recognized, like, why sit around and wait? Let's go control our own destiny. Yeah. And so that's what we do. That's the the pressure, the burden, if you will, that we feel when we partner with pharmacists to join our platform, we have to bring new services to pharmacists, get them pre-approved by our clients. Today, they're health plans. They may be different types of providers in the future, but that's what's exciting, right? And so we at Aspen are working really hard every single day to identify new monetization opportunities for the clinical skills of the pharmacist and then bring that to bear on the platform. So again, this morning, Poly Pharmacy is one. Um, we'll have a new initiative rolling out next week for another subset of pharmacists to live in a certain area and have a certain skill set. So we will continue to iterate and 2023 should be a real landmark year for us. And we feel like we're just getting started. So to your point, Blair, um, you know, I would encourage any pharmacist, don't sit around and wait for perfect. Um, we are far from perfect. We make tons of mistakes. We create way too much pain and friction for our pharmacists, but we know that and we were working hard to minimize that. And, you know, Adam, who's on the video here with us, he's joining us just as an observer because he represents our pharmacist. He is responsible for this community and uh, the voice of our customer in these pharmacists is super important to us. And speaking of the voice, don't forget everybody, the Q&A functionality down below. If you do want to submit a question, feel free to drop that there. Um, Laura, are you on the line? Because we actually I have am. a question for you. Okay, yep. great. So the first question for you, Laura, is that there's a lot of buzz in the profession about the three T's, test, treat, and triage, particularly in the ambulatory and community pharmacy roles. And so as these roles evolve, how does a pharmacist within the community fit in? Great question. And uh, first of all, happy National Pharmacy Week, Pharmacist Week. I'm glad to be on the call today and I apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, when I think about the three T's and I look at Aspen's community, I really think that we live inside of the triage and treat. Although you're not dispensing the medication to the patient, you're really ensuring that the treatments that are prescribed are safe, appropriate, uh, non-duplicative with multiple prescribers that oftentimes a patient has. And when I think about triage, it's another important function. So many of you in your uh, stories that you share oftentimes see a situation that requires escalation whether that escalation is to the provider or to the health plan. Uh, and it's when you do that and you capture that in your notes and that's passed along in as close to real time as possible to the health plan, that's making a real difference in the patient's lives. And so I think as I look to 2023, uh, I see a lot of different types of clinical interventions. And I also see a time where in addition to the medication history that you have in front of you when you make these interventions, there might be a lot more data in the future. You know, we might have access to labs or hemoglobin A1Cs or blood pressures. So as the platform continues to evolve and our conversations with different clients evolve, I could see pharmacists really tapping into new and data outside of medication history when you're making those interventions. So I get real excited about that. So, Laura, a quick follow-up question, maybe to lighten the mood. Um, so in 2022 uh, virtual panel, uh, technical difficulty, is that a bad hair day? <laughs> no, it's not actually. Ironically, I'm sitting here laughing because really when um, Aspen was co-founded, right? You said to yourself, well, we want to make this a simple telephone call for the patients. And so I'm, 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 uh, I'm laughing to myself because we said, do we want to do a telephonic, uh, a teleconference with the patient? Consider me one of those patients that would have that technical difficulty and thankful that the Aspen platform is a, is a phone call away. That's great. Thanks. So Blair, we have a question. Oh, 
Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say, there's it, with technology, there there's always something that's changing. I I remember first starting to use Zoom in really in 2017, and and so many things have changed since then, which has also created a lot of opportunity for people. Just just like this opportunity with with Aspen to be able to provide care. So. So, you know, everything um, is constantly evolving, but you, you know, you always have those, those things that, that are unforeseen with, uh, with technology stuff. So Blair, if you don't mind, I'm going to actually take this one over to you. So we're continuing to see the okay. identity of pharmacists shift and the rest of the world adapts either hybrid or fully remote, kind of parlaying off of your technology comment here. Um, can you tell us about how you envision the future of the pharmacist identity evolving over time? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, looking at trends uh, in the business world, the <clears throat> this shift to kind of a gig economy started way before COVID, probably five years before COVID, as we were seeing more and more work from home tele uh, commute type opportunities popping up. And then there was also an, a book written about the, the freelance or gig economy. And so when I started kind of following this trend uh, back in 2015, 2016, I, I never saw how, how this gig economy would relate to pharmacists until I started doing MTM consulting. And so it was really through MTM Consulting that I was able to use my pharmacy knowledge in, in a completely new way. And I realized, oh, you know, I'm not limited to the patients here just in my local area like, like we traditionally have been. And the other thing, because pharmapreneur is kind of this word that I, I made up to help shift the identity. I think sometimes we get stuck in, well, I'm a pharmacist, so you know, I, I have to be a certain way or I can only talk about certain things. I have to really stay and fit within this box. And that's fine, but it's also when our goal is innovation, our goal is advancing the practice of pharmacy. I kind of needed a new a new uh, angle, a new a new way to describe myself to shift into that idea of expansion and entrepreneurship. And so it kind of came up with this word pharmapreneur. And, and I remember talking about MTM services because coming out of school, I, you know, at the time I, I didn't really have access to do a lot of patient care services. Um, I was working first in a small community pharmacy, uh, an independently owned pharmacy, which, which I still love and they do a great job here in my hometown. And then I went to clinical hospital, but I still wasn't getting that meaningful work. I, I wasn't feeling that I was truly making a difference in the patient's care. So, you know, the idea of where we want to go as a profession, I think for a long time, I thought, well, you know, the, the organizations or the pharmacy schools or whatever, like they, they um, are in charge of creating these opportunities when I realized that that responsibility was actually on me as an individual to go out and create these opportunities for myself. I had to uh, kind of break free of, of that, that box that I had myself in of like, this is what a traditional pharmacist does. So I'll give you an example. I was working with a pharmacist uh, the other day, and this was just a 15 minute discovery call I had with her. And she was thinking about, she had been experienced in managed care and, and she, she was actually working on the specialty side of things. And so she was talking about having a passion for um, neurodegenerative, uh, neurodegenerative autoimmune diseases, specifically MS, and um, wanting to 
be able to leave that position so she could spend more time caregiving for her family members with MS and do something different in her career. And so I just encouraged her. I said, you know, you, you've really built this expertise in this subject um, of, of autoimmune and neurodegenerative diseases. What if you were able to take that experience and take that expertise and use that to become kind of a, a thought leader, become a pharmacist who is an expert in that particular condition, that particular niche. And that's an opportunity that I think every single one of us as individuals have to be able to understand what meaningful work looks like to us and how does our background combine with what we actually want to do with our careers in order to create something entirely new, something that you may have to make up a word to, to describe to other people, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's, it's about whether you want to do hybrid or work from home. It's, it's about giving yourself options and creating a, a, a blend of work that feels meaningful to you. And, and that's, that's where I think this opportunity with Aspen really comes in. If you, if you want to continue that professional development and continue to grow in your career, there's a lot of opportunities available for how do I do that uh, within the company and within this context to, to really help choose what is, what is my blend of work and what is work that is meaningful to me because when you're doing work that's meaningful to, to you as a pharmacist, as an MTM consultant, you're going to get better outcomes for your patients as well because you are, are really focusing on their needs and you're coming from a place of understanding because this pharmacist that, that I mentioned had, had been there and she had been there as a caregiver and she had seen her family go through those things. So she was really able to empathize with patients that she was working with uh, in her managed care position. So it's really about kind of seeing yourself in a new way. And that's not always easy, but it is very, very helpful for continuing your personal and professional development journey. Blair, maybe to piggyback on there and uh, Jen, I think the, the initial question was related to kind of workforce trends in 2023 20, between now and kind of going forward. Um, I don't have the stat in front of me, but I remember reading a stat uh, looking at um, kind of work. So we, I think everyone has heard the term, the great resignation, which is what we've lived through mm -hmm. with COVID. And it wasn't that people decided they just were going to completely stop working. What Kind of the next part of that story, when you look at the data says is in 2021, there were more LLCs, so limited liability corporations. So typically these are companies of 10 people or less. And the trend actually was new companies of one to two people. There were two times more LLCs in 2021 than the previous record that was set in 2019. So COVID accelerated the spirit of entrepreneurship. People were home, technology was catching up to these visions. This was like a renaissance for small business. And so for us at Aspen, we were ahead of this curve. We had kind of started building this idea of this gig economy for pharmacists, but you talk about like just everything aligning, the tailwinds helping propel this. You have to ask yourself, why not pharmacy? Like why can every other industry iterate, innovate, why do we have to get stuck behind a counter in a basement? Why not us? And so that's our vision is to say, if you want to do it, and it's really hard and it's really scary and nobody pays your health insurance, but if you're in a place where you can dabble in this gig economy, you could you know, augment your primary income. And then as you gain more and more confidence, more and more visibility into what the, the next chapter looks like, you could then take the leap and go build a business for yourself. And so Pharmacy provides a really unique opportunity where you can bridge. You can go work as many hours as you, as you want in retail and make enough money to support yourself and your family 
while you figure out being an entrepreneur. And there aren't many company and industries that allow you to do that. So it's a very neat place. It's very scary, but you got to trust yourself, trust in your partners and know that, you know, it's, it's just persistence and perseverance. You know, David, just to tag along to that point, I got a phone call the other day from a woman who has been working as a compounding pharmacist for the past decade. And she, you know, has been following Aspen recently. And, and she really said the same thing, you know, I need a change. I'd love to do something different. And, and I said, the beauty about getting started with Aspen is that, you know, while you're figuring it out and while you're, you know, you're seeing whether this new opportunity in this very dynamic organization, which is so different than, you know, most traditional other career choices, you don't have to kind of give up your day job until you've really made a concerted effort to, to try something new and different. And so I was, you know, I was encouraged to chat with her and even more encouraged that, you know, this environment is something that you can set a goal for yourself. Like I'm going to work for Aspen for the next six months while still doing my compounding job. And if I can make that pivot and make it successfully, this might give me the, you know, flexibility. And, and in this case, this is a mom who wants to be able to go to her soccer games on weeknights and, you know, pick up her kids from school and take them to scouts or whatever. So I think it was pretty cool. And I do think it's a, a neat opportunity that you can explore and pour your heart into and make sure it's the right fit. There's very few other types of models where you don't have to leave one setting 100% to figure out um, can I do this? And, and Blair, I've appreciated, you know, and I think members of the community appreciate your uh, thoughts and insights into all the other aspects, the non-clinical aspects of how to set up your own clinical practice that you've provided over the past several months, because I think that gives, gives us more of a comfort level when making that switch. Absolutely. We're, we're, um not generally risk takers um yes. you know i don't i don't want to generalize and and create uh blanket statements but in general um i i think that it's a disservice to tell people to get into business you gotta quit your job burn the boats go all in and and that's not that's not at all what we're saying. We're saying that you can build your consulting services. You can build your own business alongside your traditional role. So I I, I did not have that that kind of safety net. I in 2014 I was working as a clinical hospital pharmacist, and because of budget cuts and reimbursement and being the low man on the totem pole, I found myself without a job. And I never thought that I would be in that place of not only was I, you know, finding myself really going out looking for a job, but I was also six months pregnant at the time. So that was, was kind of the, the thing that knocked me off of my path onto the entrepreneurial path, because then I kind of went to the other side of like, oh, it's risky to, you know, to only have a single income in this economy that I need to build multiple strings of in, streams of income. And then I went kind of went to the far other end of that, but I think settling in a nice place to, to where you can say, this is the number of days that, that I want to work on my business. And just like you said, Laura, setting those goals around, you know, being able to give this business opportunity your all for the next six months and really work on it to set aside time to, to make it a priority. Because that's the other thing that I hear after people ask, do I need an LLC? Do I need, you know, liability insurance, all those things. It's like, how did I find the time to do this? And my, my answer is, you know, we all have the, the same amount of time. So it's about prioritizing your time. And it's, you know, maybe about setting some boundaries around some other things so that you can have time to work on growing your business so that in six months, you're really to 
a place to where you can make that decision. Do I want to leave or do I want to go? And, and for me, it was really about getting clear where I was in my own financial plan. So, you know, what are, what are my fixed expenses every month? And, and some of that stuff to set goals around, this is the amount of, of income I'm looking to generate with my side business until I get to a certain point that I can, you know, cut back in, in my, my other, uh, you know, employees, my W2 work. So I, I talk about W2 work and W9 work and the differences in that. So there's, there's lots of opportunities. And I think that it can be done alongside your current role. So thank you for pointing that out too, Laura. Yeah, and maybe just to uh, put a cherry on top of that entire conversation about entrepreneurship and kind of workforce trends. Uh, I mean, the whole reason you're on the panel here and have been with us on this journey, Blair, is, you know, kind of our collective awareness. And I'll use myself as an example. And everything I've done in my life, whether it's academic or sports, I went through training. Like somebody, you know, I, I was trained as a pharmacist. I was trained as a business person. I played baseball and tennis and had coaching and hours of commitment. The only thing I never trained or got coaching on was golf, but I'm a terrible golfer. <laughs> and so it became uh, apparent to us that, you know, all of our pharmacists are extremely well-trained clinicians and they're very passionate about patient care, but so few had the business training. And so if we really were going to inspire people to join this platform and become entrepreneurs, we wanted to augment that. We wanted to provide that service to help at least, you know, start the process from a business training perspective. And so that's when we engaged you. And we just had this awareness that the next step for our pharmacist in the community is this level of training and confidence. And so we're pleased to have you join. And, you know, Laura is very supportive in that process as well. We actually just received a question that might be interesting <clears throat> to kind of parlay Blair off of what you just said. So the comment, it's a comment and question, um, and it says, you all are very inspiring. I wanted to ask everybody on the panel um, of healthcare leaders how to take the first step to launching an innovative business idea successfully without being overwhelmed. As a pharmacist who has a lot of ideas for innovation, but limited business experience, I struggle with knowing the first step to take. And so this is actually kind of a common pull through that other folks submitted into the chat. So maybe you could, Blair, give everybody something that's like very actionable and granular as to like how they can get started with becoming a, in this case, pharmapreneur. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think Seneca said something along the lines of uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And I, I like to say, even if we got provider status tomorrow, there would be a lot of uh, things that would still need to be in place for a pharmacist to practice at the top of their license and to be able to do clinical services. So one thing um, in order to kind of prepare yourself to take that entrepreneurial opportunity and, and take that next step, whatever it may look like in your career, is to create the foundation. So some of the, the legal things that we talked about in our Becoming a Pharmapreneur series, how to do the LLC and keeping your W-9 income separate from W-2 income. But I think the deeper question there is, what is it that you want to do? You know, and I, I really want you to think about is there, look at your background, look at your experience, look at your strengths, look at the, the challenges that you've been through in your own life. Because I've seen pharmacists doing everything from gut health to weight management to just really innovative stuff like working with functional neurologists to help people to um, shift the dysregulated autonomic nervous system. And so when, when we really get out of that box of we're the medication experts, we're, we're also, as David mentioned in the very beginning, experts on deprescribing experts on how to how to get better outcomes for people how to encourage them to make these behavioral changes so 
on the, I, I kind of talk about this like a spectrum on the spectrum of from coach to consultant, how much in depth patient care work do you really want to be doing? Do you, do you want to kind of stay in the, in the counseling piece where you're giving them bits of information or, or do you want to go deeper? Do you want to work with these patients in a more long-term fashion or, or clients uh, if you prefer to, to work with individual clients? So when you, when you have the, the understanding of this is the value that I can bring and you're aware of your value and you start speaking about your value. And so this is something I wanna put out a challenge to everybody during pharmacist week is to talk about the value that you bring. And sometimes I think pharmacists, we, we talk about our value to other pharmacists, but we don't necessarily talk about it outside of pharmacy. So it doesn't have to be anything mind blowing. I mean, it doesn't have to be like change uh, in, you know, in the first line therapy kind of thing. It, it can be as simple as I remember there was uh, one of my friends was asking me about doing a ketogenic diet. And I've, I've done intermittent fasting and different ketogenic diets. And so I reminded her, just make sure you're taking a multivitamin while you're on one of these diets. And she was like, oh, really? That's interesting. Why? And so I explained a little bit about electrolytes and, and how it could affect kidney function. And then her next point was, well, I can't swallow multivitamins. And so then I got to explain that there's way more dosage forms than just the, the, the large tablets for multivitamins. So even little stuff like that, talk about what you're doing, talk about your own experience, talk about your own health journey, talk about how you, you know, work with family members or friends to overcome their own health challenges. Because when you start doing that, I think other people start seeing, oh, there, there is a lot more to being a pharmacist than maybe what I, I thought in the beginning. So when you have that, that mindset shift, to begin providing value, you know, you can do that in a way that encourages people to reach out to you. So, um, you know, I, I like to say one of my isms is um, to have a business, you have to talk about your business. And, and I really, I, I, for even someone starting out, in order to have a business, in order to develop thought leadership, you have to feel comfortable having these conversations. And so, you know, being able to, to talk about your work here with Aspen or talk about the things you're passionate about or the things you've been through, that's a great place to start. And that's just kind of a, a little breadcrumb that you can begin to follow. If you're curious about gut health, if you're curious about, uh, I don't know, travel planning and travel vaccines, I've seen consultants make businesses out of travel planning for people. So there's really, when you start opening up the, the idea of um, moving outside of the traditional role of the pharmacist, there's so many innovative things that, that you could do. And I'm happy to, if, you know, if someone wants to contact me on LinkedIn or something, happy to kind of that that back and forth and brainstorm some ideas for things that you could possibly do. Hey, Jen, uh, maybe just to uh, follow on to the question about um, lots of ideas, how do I get started? And one of the things I love about expert panels is, I don't know that we're always aligned in our approaches. Um, and that's what's great, right? There's no right or wrong answer. They're just different ideas that have worked for us in, in our track record. So. Uh, my two cents in that question, regardless of the idea, is uh, something like this. So first, you want to fail fast and you want to fail cheap. So I would not over engineer any initial idea. And I would go as far as to say, if you're currently a W-2 pharmacist working somewhere, the need to run out and create an LLC and start a business, like first, just figure out if there's something there. So fail fast, fail cheap. There's an idea called a proof of concept, a POC, if you look that up. You want to... Kind of do the least amount of things to test your idea 
to see if it's viable or not. So you need a really strong hypothesis and you need a way to measure whether your idea works or not. And so if you can create a hypothesis and some measurement criteria and a structure around a proof of concept, you're cooking with gas and go after it. Uh, second, if the proof of concept comes back and it appears like there's something there, you might wanna take the next step, which is known as a minimally viable product or an MVP. Now you're gonna start investing a little more time, energy, money. You probably wanna get a little bit of structure behind you to do that. The one caution I would throw out there is if you are a W-2 pharmacist and you're employed somewhere, be careful if you're testing your idea with your employer because <laughs> what you're creating is known as intellectual property and that may be actually owned by your employer if you're testing the idea behind the counter. So um, know what it is you're doing, know kind of the intellectual property rights, if you will, and fail fast and fail cheap. Most ideas fail. And so you want to learn that very quickly. It doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It just means whatever that initial hypothesis was doesn't work. And you can iterate from there. So just my two cents from my experience. Thank you, David. Um, Laura, unless you had something to add to that as far as what folks can do, you know, tactically right now, there actually is an interesting question that came in for you here around uh, workforce trends. So kind of circling back to what we discussed earlier in the panel. So somebody writes in that during the pandemic, we saw that telehealth and remote patient monitoring grew exponentially. Now some of those types of consultations, especially by PCPs, um, are declining. So what do you see as the future for pharmacists and telehealth and remote patient monitoring and how might that impact us in the Aspen community over time? Great question. So um, I think that there's a lot, obviously, that we're seeing with um, patients that are actually given blood pressure machines in their home by a particular company or their health plan, and their health plan wants them to monitor that blood pressure every day or their blood sugar. And so I honestly think for ph both pharmacists and nurses, that remote patient monitoring is going to be very much a part of our future. And I could even see it possibly being part of Aspen's future at a point in time as well. Um, because just if you, if there was a red flag thrown up by a patient who might be hypoglycemic, you know, it would be great for a pharmacist to be able to check in with that patient or the reverse is true as well. Um, so, I, I believe that, you know, as I look into 2023 and beyond, remote patient monitoring is here to stay. Telehealth is, is on the decline, but with the primary care shortages that we have in the physician community, I think pharmacists are going to be called upon to fulfill some of those roles as well. So you almost actually answered the next question that we received, Laura, but somebody is asking you here that you have worked um, in many facets of healthcare over the years. And so what excites you most about the future of um, Aspen's community and the opportunities that we have within the community? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I started in consulting pharmacy. That was my first job out of college. And we always used to talk about the separation of the dispensing of long-term care uh, pharmaceuticals with the consulting services, and there always wanted to be a separation. And Aspen really gives you the separation, you know, uh, and, and enables the pharmacists in our community to start their own clinical practice and to be able to practice at the top of their license. And, um, you know, that may be overused, but it's really true. You know, you're not touching product at this point and you're interacting with patients just on their disease state. So you're playing not only uh, a clinical role, but you're also really playing an educator role. And I love it when I see inside of the platform how the platform isn't just about going through medication after medication after medication, but it's also giving you the opportunity to talk to them about how they're managing their diabetes or their hypertension. So you're playing an educator role as well as a clinical role. And, uh, you know, you're developing your practice. And yeah, it's tough. And there was something in the chat about, you know, some days you feel like you're cooking with 
fire, oil, and, and other days you're, you know, you're coming up dry. And, and I think, um, <laughs> I think that sometimes if you asked any of us on the phone, I look at Blair, you know, running your own business, some days you have a really good day. And then some days at the end of the day, you say to yourself, what did I accomplish today? Or what was my win? And um, you're going to have those days and, and you just have to kind of keep it in, in balance. Um, that would be my thoughts. I love that. And, and to kind of piggyback on the, the remote patient monitoring opportunity, I really see that as a way to provide these meaningful interventions. And so when we think about pharmacist interventions and what we want to talk to our patients about educating them, um, you know, on potential adverse reactions. I think one of the the uh, the real values of pharmacists is to, if we're looking at blood glucose or blood pressure, for example, being able to see in real time um, is this is this being related to an adherence issue, or is the medication not working properly and needs to be. Um, increased in dosage or change to something else. And, and these aren't necessarily questions that um, a, a physician, because they, if they're not looking at the remote patient monitoring, they're not looking at the trend throughout the month, they may think, oh, okay, well, your blood pressure's up today. I'm going to increase it. So this happened in, in my own family. Um, my mother-in-law kept, <laughs> her doctor kept increasing her labetalol dose and got to the point to where when she would actually take it like she was supposed to, her blood pressure would just completely bottom out. So I really see how technology and, and being able to, to use, I mean, technology is advancing to the point to where now we're going to, to be able to see some of these blood glucose and do continuous glucose monitoring in real time it's also going to give us better data to help make those interventions. Is this a dietary issue? Is this an adherence issue? Is this the, maybe this drug is not right for this person's genetic makeup. And so then we can get into pharmacogenomic testing. There's just so much there. It's really exciting to, to see how technology platforms can help us do our jobs better and make these interventions more meaningful. So it's it's really exciting to me when we start talking about things like chronic care management, remote patient monitoring, and really doing the, the clinical interventions. I think that's that's where um, where I see the future of pharmacy going is is really in that uh, after the diagnosis and the medication therapy is started, that pharmacists can really take uh, take over a lot of the management and the lifestyle changes and behavioral changes that will help to get that patient better outcomes. Um, just to tag on to what Blair said, you know, if you look ahead to 2023 and we talk about clinical and education roles, you know, there, there will be the introduction of some very new and exciting cell and gene therapies coming to market um, for you know, diseases like Duchenne's disease and, and people are excited about some of these specialty treatments that are coming. We'll also see the introduction of some biosimilars coming into the market. And, you know, patients don't always understand, you know, what is a biosimilar? Is this a generic drug? You know, should I be on this? Is it the same as the brand? And so when I think about opportunities uh, that may come down the pike in 2023 and beyond for the community. I'm excited to see uh, the roles that the Aspen community can play when some of these uh, specialty therapies continue to hit the market. Laura, so that actually is a great segue to a question that we received for you as well. And it says that as you see more and more pharmacists working with Aspen as more than just a side gig, what advice do you have for us so that we can stay clinically relevant and at the top of our game? Yeah, so great question. And uh, you're talking to someone who just finished uh, attending the AMCP conference. And so, 
you know, I think that it's going to be really important, no matter what your maybe professional association is that you might call home to really, you know, dive deep and take some meaningful uh, CEs that uh, really will help keep you on top of some of the clinical advances that we're seeing in the market. Um, as well as, you know, there are some very good certification programs out there. You know, I recently was talking to a board certified psychopharmacologist. And, you know, again, if I looked into my, you know, crystal ball, I think behavioral health and monitoring patients with, um, you know, major depressive disorder and bipolar and so many of their other mental health conditions might be something that the community is called upon to do. And there's so many new therapies in this area. So I really think whether it's written or whether you have an opportunity to attend some of these conferences, the uh, clinical skills on some of the new drugs coming out will be very important. David, we just received a question for you that says, right now we are calling on behalf of health plans. Do you see a shift in that over the next few years? That will shift um, with two variables. One is as our, at, at Aspen, we think of the world in kind of two segments. We have our customers, which we think of you as our pharmacists um, because we partner with you, right? And then we have our clients who today are health plans. And so as we evolve our client mix and we go from health plans to potentially at-risk providers or accountable care organizations, or maybe life science companies or centralized specialty pharmacies, we may be calling on behalf of the sponsor of our program. So it could be a foundation that is supporting patients who do start on a specialty medication. And so we would call on behalf of that foundation. So we are representing our client in that. However, the other variable that may evolve in our ultimate goal is as we build a panel of patients for you. And so as you are out calling patients, you know, making connections, doing good uh, for the patient and their family. And at the end of that survey, when they're asked, do you want the same pharmacist in the future? You are building a panel for yourself. And so we may reach a point in time when um, our clients would allow you as their pharmacist to call on your behalf. And so you may be representing yourself calling from Aspen to complete that consult. We're not there yet. I ultimately don't know what that vision is, but um, today we are calling on behalf of our clients and our clients are represented as health plans. And as that evolves, then you know the, the positioning of the consult itself will evolve. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. We also received a question that wasn't directed at, at any one of you in particular, so feel free to chime in and make this interactive, but um, somebody writes in that it's so great that Aspen pharmacists can work remotely. Um, do you believe that in the future, the laws will become more stringent and pharmacists would need to be multi-state licensed, or will the state lines continue to be open for interstate MTM practicing? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in first. Um, this is, uh, whoa, it got uh, vertigo all of a sudden, Laura. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is a moving target. And one of our responsibilities in being your business partner is to stay close to this. So we have an internal team, compliance team, outside consultants, and legal counsel that is tracking this. Mm -hmm. So the evolution of all of this is uh, just to give you kind of 90 seconds on it. Uh, we had reached out to the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy pre-COVID, and they were very excited about what we were building, and they were creating a program they were calling their passport program. And so any Aspen pharmacist would be put into this passport program, and your state licensure would be, through this passport program, acknowledged in other states. And so they were confident in our quality assurance practices, how the technology matched pharmacists and accounted for state licensure. They were very comfortable with that. COVID hits, I mean, literally the week we were going to announce this at the NABP meet, at the NABP meeting, uh, COVID hits, emergency auth authorization goes out, pretty much every state lets down their guard and lets practitioners do whatever they need to do to care for patients. It was chaos. What we're seeing, however, is the pendulum was swinging back aggressively 
And not all states, but many states are starting to tighten their borders, so to speak, from a licensure perspective. So there are still, I think, more than half of the states out there that allow states to call across lines, licenses to call across lines. We've mapped all of those. The states that require the state licensure, we know that as well. And then we do have some clients that have a strong preference to the pharmacist actually living in the state as well. So we are monitoring all of these variables. You will only see opportunities on the platform that you are allowed to contact, either because of where you live or where you're licensed. So to be safe, if you're asking the question, should you go get more state licensure? I mean, the answer is always yes. There's a uh, return on investment equation in there, right? Because it costs money, it costs time, there's maintenance. So that's a question for you. Like if you're living in a state where you have enough opportunities on our platform, you know, your funnel remains full and you know, you're motivated by what you're seeing, there's probably not a need. But if, if you're living in a state where either A, you're hearing it's getting more restrictive and you're not being, the reciprocity of your license isn't being represented outside of your state, or if there's just not enough opportunities, you can solve that by going to get a different state license. Uh, so we're monitoring it, it's a moving target, but we've, we're putting some real resources behind this. Thank you. We also received an interesting question, David, that says, how can we grow into leadership positions within Aspen RX Health? Uh, it's a great question. I ask myself that every day. Um, yeah, um, I, I think uh, just showing up, working hard, right? And um, that's always been my own personal belief, whether it was sports or early in my career and work. Um, you you want to stand out and you do that through performance and just a can-do attitude and spirit. Um, again, we're not perfect. We're trying to do everything we can to make the platform as easy to use, but we know who our stars are. We've built a, an actual rewards program around that to recognize who our stars are. And uh, when there are opportunities to more formally engage with pharmacists in our community, that's where we start. We start with our top performers who help us understand our product, how the product can be optimized to attend our huddles and give us good constructive feedback and not just all negative, but here's negative and here's how you fix it, um, but also just show up and get the work done even when it's hard. That's where we start. And so I don't know that there's you know a real specific matrix, but it's just a can-do spirit that we all love at Aspen. And David, I, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize some of the great mentors that we've had with Aspen over the past year. So those of you who give of your time to someone who's brand new in the community and has a lot of questions. And so there have been mentors that have mentored uh, a new pharmacist for three weeks. There's been others who've mentored them for three months. So to me, you are the leaders within our community and, and you've been very giving of your time and your expertise, which is helping other people grow into this new model, which is very different for people. Could be a little scary. So thank you for your leadership, those of you who have served as mentors over the past year. Well said, Absolutely. Laura. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have so many questions in the Q&A that we unfortunately are not going to be able to get to as I look at um, the time on the clock here, but we will answer your questions. Thank you, everybody who has um, taken the time and the thought to submit some. We will be back in touch with you and make sure that we answer them some way, somehow. David, Laura, Blair, thank you all so much um, for today's session. We hope for our community team that this was informative and valuable. We really look forward to seeing you at another event this week. And from all of us um, on your team here in Aspen, we wanted to just wish you a happy National Pharmacy Week and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, thanks. all. Thanks, yep. everybody. Thanks for, thank you for having me. Appreciate it.